Welcome everyone. My name is Sally McAlpine and I will be the chair of this morning's Wednesday seminar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. Today's speaker, David Houston, is a principal research scientist at Geoscience Australia. Many of you will know him, but I'd like to say a few words about his background. After completing a Bachelor of Science at the Colorado School of Mines and a Master's of Science at the University of Arizona, David came across the Pacific to undertake a PhD at the University of Tasmania in Economic Geology. After postdocs at UTAS and at the Geological Survey of Canada, he joined the then AGSO in 1995 and has been in Canberra ever since. His first project at GA was the Pilbara Project. This was when he first considered the formation of mineral deposits in a metallogenic or systems framework. Since then, he has worked collaboratively in every state and territory in Australia, in terrains that range from the Paleoarchean to the Cenozoic. This in combination with experience in Archean and Paleoproterozoic provinces in Canada and North America has engendered an interest in metallogenesis at the continental to global scale. An interest that has been supported by work around Australia and most recently with the Geological Survey of Canada and the USGS in, critical mineral, in the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative. Today, David will be speaking on the findings that temporal and spatial distributions of convergent margin ore deposits reflect changes in tectonic processes through time. The title of his talk is Convergent Margin Metallogenic Cycles, a window to secular changes in the Earth's tectonic evolution. Please welcome David Houston. Okay, thank you, Sarlai. Um, just looking through the audience, it's it's good to see that there's a lot of really hot, good technical people here, but to um, include some of the people who are not so technical, I'm gonna actually uh, define some terms. But first, let's go to the title. Okay, I'm gonna be looking at ore deposits that form long con uh, convergent margins. And there's been a lot of actual discussion in the last two or three decades about tectonic processes and how they've evolved through time, back from the earliest Archean to modern systems. And the work that I've been doing with uh, a number of other people suggests that we can actually use um, mineral deposits, which form along convergent margins, as a window into some of the tectonic processes and the evolution of the Earth. This work is done uh, with Mike Dublier sitting in the back, but also with some colleagues from the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, Sally Pearson and, and Patrick mercier Longvin, a uh, colleague from the University of Saskatchewan at Bruce Eglinton, and a colleague from the Memorial University of Newfoundland, and then finally a colleague from the Geological Survey of Finland. It started from a presentation I was asked to give at a conference in, in, in Vancouver, comparing Archean tectonics versus um, Phanerozoic tectonics. So without any further ado, we'll move to the next slide. And just as I said, I'm going to try and bring people up. This is a, uh, a very broad um, talk. And so I'm going to just define a few terms. So what is a convergent margin? And this is a diagram that you can see. Uh, it's a pretty typical one that you find um, in the literature or, or on Google. And basically a convergent margin is a plate margin at which generally oceanic crust is being consumed by subduction. And the diagram you see over here, you have your subducting plate being subducted underneath your overriding plate. Okay. And then in the overriding plate, you have three parts. You have the fore arc, which is so-called before the arc. Then you have a magmatic arc, which is shown here as a series of volcanoes and then you have the back arc. In the subducting plate, it's largely oceanic crust, not always, but largely. And the important thing is a concept of slab pull. So it's basically the density of this plate as, it, as it's cool relative to the uh, enclosing mantle, which actually drives or pulls 
the drives the subduction and pulls this plate underneath the overriding plate. And that'll come back later on when we, when we move on into the talk. Okay, the other thing we need to talk about is mineral deposits. And so this is just a, a basically economic geology 101, looking at convergent um, ore deposits. And so we're going to talk about four of them, four general types. We're going to talk about volcanic host massive sulfide deposits. And here we have a diagram of a modern Black Sea smoker. And you can see this in, in a lot of the um, general public literature where you have hot springs on the sea floor and they're actually precipitated uh, mass of sulfide or sulfide minerals. And a volcanic hosted mass of sulfide deposit is one of these deposits. It's a mass of sulfide, it accumulates at the seafloor hot springs, and it contains copper, zinc, lead, silver, and gold. Another deposit type that I'm going to talk about is a porphyry copper deposit. These are magmatic related deposits. This is a typical sort of texture that you see in a porphyry copper deposit. We have stockwork veins, and the black bits that you see are the actual sulfide sea ore minerals. It's generally associated with high level intermediate intrusions and it's an association of copper plus or minus moly plus or minus gold. The next deposit type that I'm going to talk about is orogenic gold. And you can see here, you might be able to make out that there's a bit of yellow shiny stuff that's actually gold. And you can see it's associated with a, a, a quartz vein. And these quartz veins occur during or around the same time as orogenesis. Okay, so that's why they're called orogenic gold, and obviously they're gold deposits, and that's the main um, things. The last thing we're going to talk about is pegmatites, and these are the wonderful rocks that you see um, where you can see really huge crystals. I think that's a spodumene crystal, and that's a, uh, I think, Mr. Simmons uh, for uh, scale, and these things are associated with lithium, tantalum, and tin deposits. Okay, so that's a general observation of what a convergent ore deposit, margin ore deposits are. Now I'll actually start to look at the secular changes. And I'm not going to go into detail on this diagram, just to illustrate that there are a number of features which change through geological time. Okay, one of the more important ones is the presence or absence of chromatiites. Chromatiites basically shut down at the end of the Archean. Um, you get changes in, in, in uh, arc-like uh, magnetism. So you have TTGs here, and then you have less TTGs here. So there's a few characteristics that change through geological time. Okay, and the main driver of that is thought to be the mantle temperature evolution. So how has the temperature of the mantle changed? The other thing is that we see active characteristics uh, active margin characteristics changes, for instance, metamorphism, ultra high uh, pressure, and the style of subduction. So there are changes through uh, time. And we're going to actually look at a different set of data sets, and we're actually going to add a new set of, of criteria that we can look at the system in, and we're going to use metallogenesis as a tool to track the secular changes in tectonic processes. The one thing which I've found and others have found over the last you know, a couple of decades, is that the different stages of convergent margin evolution have distinct metallogenic inventories. And that's quite important. That's what we're actually going to try and use to get back into the tectonic um, history. Okay, this diagram here is just comparing neo well, it, it, this slide is comparing neo versus Phanerozoic Earth, the heat flow and tectonics. The diagram you see over here is from uh, Mike Brown. And what it illustrates is uh, the temperature and pressure of metamorphism, okay? And the, the white colored dots here are older, i.e. about 850 million years, whereas the black dots are old, uh, younger, about 485 million years, and the blue-gray dots are somewhere in between. And you can see there's actually a change in the uh, thermal characteristics of metamorphism over, t over time, and that actually relates to a change in the uh, thermal uh, gradients. Okay. The other things that we need to talk about is the chromatiates are abundant in the Neo-Archean, but virtually absent in the Phanerozoic. The high magnesium mantle-derived magnetism in, in the Archean, these are um, the synucatoids and things like that. And there's also a change in, in, in tectonic style. At about the late Neo-Protozoic, the presence of ultra-high pressure metamorphism, and also over time, we go from super cratons to supercontinents. So there's quite a 
few changes as we go through geological time. Now this can actually be con con um, visualized, at least for the Phanerozoic, in, a, in a, a model that Bill Collins and I don't know who's Richard's first name, put together looking at the evolution of, 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 of convergence. Okay, and so he has actually has four stages. The first one is first stage rollback, i.e. you have a subducting plate. It rolls back, i.e. it moves in that direction. And because of that, it actually puts ex, uh, ex, extensional strain into the upper plate. And there you form back arc basins. Okay, and that's sort of the standard sort of uh, stable configuration in these systems. But then something happens. And in this case, Bill's argued for uh, flat, uh, sub, uh, uh, flattening of the subduction, which actually puts uh, contractional um, strain into the upper plate and you actually get, you start to fold things and you, and you, and you get orogenesis. Okay, at some point, the thing has to become stable again. So this is an unstable environment. So it goes, uh, becomes uh, stable again and you go back to a normal, more, uh, a normal style of, of subduction. Uh, either the, the slab, uh, changes its, 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 um, style of subduction. And then you get the second stage rollback, and that involves uh, extension and also post-constructional magnetism. And then finally, you end the, cy the cycle with your back to, to where you started from. And this was largely based on the uh, Lachlan Fold Belt. And so now we actually look at mineral deposits in, in relationship to that uh, tectonic cycle that, that Bill talks about. So we have subduction here, and unfortunately, it's swapped back to front. But you will see that in these systems, you have VHMS deposits form forming in the back arc systems, and you have calcium and porphyry copper deposits forming in the arcs. And those are the two main styles of mineral deposits that you find at this stage of a uh, of the convergent margin um, evolution system. And just as an example of what I'm I'm talking about here, this is a modern system. Okay, this is a, a, a map of the globe showing the location of seafloor magnetic vents. These are the black smokers or the uh, modern day volcanic coasted mass of sulfide deposits. And if you look at this, you can see there's actually two sort of locations that they form in. Okay, the first one is in the blue, which is the mid oceanic ridges, which you can see through here. They're quite common on mid oceanic ridges. But the second one, and this was discovered much later, is shown in the red, which are associated with back arc basins or rifted arcs. Okay, the important thing is that the deposits which form in the mid oceanic ridges are going to be lost either through subduction or by um, erosion. Okay, so you're actually not going to see these guys preserved in, 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 in the geological history, whereas you will see these guys preserved. Okay, so when we're looking at the ancient history, we're looking at this type of deposit. Now, if you actually go to the uh, porphyry copper deposits, and again, the same world, but in this case, I put the location of relatively young porphyry copper deposits, which is shown through here, the ones in, 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 in South America, Chile and Peru, the ones in North America, there's a whole bunch in uh, Europe uh, going out into China, and then there's the ones um, associated with uh, the subduction zone to the north of Australia um, in Indonesia and the Philippine Islands. So these things are actually marking the locations of, of, of convergent margin arcs. Okay. Now we'll move on to the second stage. Okay, so this is again Bill's um, rendition. In this case, I've actually invoked a suture. Okay, so you have the accretion of a continental um, crust onto uh, a, a convergent margin, and so you get orogenesis. And during orogenesis, you find the formation of orogenic gold deposits, which we talked about earlier, and also cobar type uh, base metal deposits, and also uh, Mississippi Valley type deposits. Okay, we're gonna actually talk specifically about orogenic uh, gold deposits as an example of this stage of, of the convergent margin evolution. The third stage is when you go into post orogenic extension. And in that case, you actually get a different suite of, of, of deposits. You, you find what are called alkalic porphyry copper deposits. We also find rare, uh, rare metal pegmatites 
and intrusion related tin tungsten, moly, and gold deposits. And this is just the initial second stage rollback uh, of, of Collins's model. So we're actually going to talk about this assemblage of deposits as we go through. Okay, so just to take take you back and remind you what we, we talked about, we have three stages in the evolution of a, a metallogenic cycle, and we're going to call this a convergent margin metallogenic cycle. We have three stages, subduction, orogenesis, and post-orogenic extension. During subduction, which we think is the equilibrium condition of convergent margins, you find commonly VHMS deposits, cal 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 porphyry copper deposits, and related epithermal deposits. During the orogenic stage, we and that's in response to some sort of a per perturbation, we find orogenic gold deposits, orogenic base metal deposits, and MVT deposits. And then finally, in post-orogenic extension, it's starting to return to equilibrium, so you get slab rollback and subduct. And commonly, you can get a subduction zone jump. And the common deposits we have are granite-related rare metal, alkalic porphyry copper deposits, and pegmatites. Now, we're going to talk specifically about the ones that are highlighted in blue in the next few uh, slides. The other thing we need to point out is that this can involve, involve the entire convergent margin, or it can involve just parts of the convergent margin. So it might happen everywhere. It might happen in, in just in, in very small parts. Okay, so as an example of this, we go to, to South America, and we actually look at the uh, Argentinian uh, Paleozoic. And so we have the uh, province here, Chilenia, which was accreted onto West Gondwana, shown in through here, at between 420 and 390 million years ago. If we actually look at the metallogenesis of that, we find this, the VHMS deposit located here at Santa Elena, and that has an age of around 444 million years. Then we find orogenic gold deposits called the Los Cayanas, and it has an age of about 390, which is very similar to the age of the inferred accretion of Chilenia onto West Gondwana. Then we have pegmatite deposits, and these are moving inboard, and they're also younger, and we have the granite-related um, rare metal deposits, again, younger and also inboard. So we're actually looking at one, uh, one convergent margin metallogenic cycle here. Okay, so if we can use this information, we can actually start to track metallogenic cycles back through time. And again, we're going to talk about three main deposit types. And why are these? Number one, they span the entire cycle. So we can actually see VHMS deposits going back to about 3.5 billion years. They're forming now. If you go to pegmatites, they're forming, uh, I think the oldest one is probably 3.2 or 3.3, and they're forming relatively recently. In orogenic gold deposits, they span from 3.4 to um, probably about 20 or 30 million years ago. So that's the first thing is they span the cycle. The second thing is they have a high preservation potential. A porphyry copper deposit because it's forming up high on the mark is unlikely to be preserved in geological time. Whereas these deposits, because they're either forming um, in a basin, in a fairly deep basin, or they're forming in the lower part of the, or the middle, middle part of the crust, they actually have a much higher preservation time. The other thing that's is important is that they're reasonably well dated. Okay, we can actually find some reasonably good consistent age dates for these deposits around the world. And speaking of the data sets that we've got, we have about 1,200 deposits with robust ages. They're from 19 metallogenic provinces from around the world. They range in age from about 3.5 billion years to, to now. And the deposits that we've considered include VHMS, calcalcal, -cal porphyry copper deposits, orthomagmatic nickel copper deposits, orogenic gold, alkalic porphyry copper deposits, and granite-related uh, rare metals and pegmatized deposits. So these are the sorts of data that we're collecting because we think that in most cases, these sorts of deposits form along convergent margins. If we actually look and step back and look at the global system, and this is a diagram just showing the distribution of uh, deposits through time. So we have pegmatites, orogenic gold deposits and VHMS deposits. And you can see there's some, some systematic patterns there. Um, 
in in the dark gray we have stability of um, super cratons or supercontinents, particularly Nuna, Rodinia, and Pangaea. Uh, in the light gray we have the um, formation or the assembly of of these supercontinents and super cratons. And in the light blue on the other side we have the um, dispersion of of the of the supercontinents. And so the other thing that we've done is we've just plotted up the, the uh, abundance of these deposits based on metal contained for, for the, the HMS and orogenic gold deposits and just the presence of uh, pegmatite fields. And from this, you can actually see some patterns. Okay, and we've talked about that. In the Fanner result, they're generally associated with convergent margins. So, i.e., when you have the assembly of Pangaea, that's when you're forming these deposits. The distribution is pulsed, and it's generally associated with super craton and supercontinent assembly. So you see it's all it's almost always in this light blue before or light gray before the, the, the dark gray, and very uncommonly in the dark gray after the assembly when things are being dispersed. And at a global scale, particularly in the Archean, and I'll just go back for you to see that again, you can actually see as a commonly a VHMS, followed by orogenic gold, followed by pegmatites. And this is at a global scale. It's also present, we think, in the uh, Paleoproterozoic and also to a certain extent in, in the Phanerozoic, but it's not as evident. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of these deposits in more in metallogenic processes. And we're gonna start in the Pilbara. Okay, so this is a map of the Pilbara. I'm not gonna ask you to, to retain what it is. All I'm gonna do is show you the distribution of the deposits. And this is the old part of the Pilbara, starting at about 3.5 here, and going down to about 3.0 billion years here. Okay, so if we actually start to plot the deposits up. So those are VHMS deposits in the dark blue, orogenic gold deposits. More VHMS deposits, another VHMS deposit. The important thing is, is that you have pulsed systems and there's no systematic pattern. Okay, you don't see that CMMC that we see in some of the other systems like in, 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 in uh, Argentina. If we go to the younger part of the Pilbara, after about 3 billion years, we actually see a slightly different pattern. Okay, so you start with the VHMS deposits. Okay, then you go to orogenic gold deposits, and you're starting to see a pattern. They're close together, and then you go to the um, pegmatite deposits. So you see that system that we talked about before of early VHMS deposits, middle orogenic gold deposits, and then late pegmatite deposits. Okay, so I want you to clue into that, and we'll see a couple of uh, couple of examples of this as we move on. So now we're going to go to the Eastern Goldfields uh, terrain, and we're going to start again with the VHMS deposits. So you had one at about 2,800, a uh, bunch at about 2,700. Then you go to the orogenic gold deposits, and this is where most of the mineralization in, in the Eastern Goldfields is. And it's, again, it's fairly, very rel well, relatively uh, constrained. There's two events probably. And then finally at the end, you get the pegmatite deposits. So again, we're seeing that tripartite uh, zonation in time. Now, in contrast, if we go to the Fanner Resort, and so we're going to go to Eastern, Eastern Australia, the Tasman element, and we're just going to go step through the same sort of thing. And I'm not going to look at details here, but just let's go through that. And there's a whole bunch of different deposit types. And you can see they span quite a long period of time, it's quasi continuous of over about 300 million years. Okay, so that's different from what we saw in the in the uh, yield garn. We think we have metal, more, multiple metallogenic cycles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in more detail later on. And it's actually very similar to other paleozoic or, or phenerozoic convergent uh, margins, the Appalachians, the Central Asian origin, or, orogenic system in the Western Cordillera. So we're actually seeing some consistent patterns. So if we actually look at this in a, in a holistic uh, point of view, and I've added a couple of uh, other 
systems in here. So we have the older pill grout, again, a long period of time, very um, pulsed and not very continuous. The younger pilbara, you have a very short period of mineralization, um, and it's and it's and it's consistent DHMS, orogenic gold, pegmatites. You see the same thing in the eastern gold fields. The same thing, particularly in the Abitibi, in the Trans Hudson's. You see, it's 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 broadly similar, but in this case, we think we've got more than one uh, mineralogenic cycles. And then finally, in the Tasman elements, it's quite different. It's chocolate and cheese. So we actually look at this in, in terms of global things, and we look at through time. We start in the, um, well, we're not going to talk about the oldest Archean, but we're going to start at the younger Pilbara. And this diagram just illustrates the time uh, or the ages and spread in ages of uh, VHMS deposits, orogenic gold deposit, and pegmatite deposits. So if you look at the uh, Meso to Neo Archean, you see VHMS deposits. Uh, orogenic gold deposits, pegmatite deposits, very consistently through all those three uh, metallogenic provinces. Okay, it's single, short-lived metallogenic cycles, less than 150 million years. If we go to the Paleo Proterozoic, we see some changes. Okay, in the Barimian, it's very much like what you see in the um, Neo Archean. But when you start to get the Speckofenian and the Trans Hudson, you actually start to see multiple um, tectonic cycles. So here you have one tectonic, uh, middle, uh, one uh, convergent margin metallogenic cycle. You have one here and you have one here. We also think we can see the same sort of things in, in Sweden or, or the Speckofenian, although it's not as well uh, defined. But other provinces, you don't see that. So it's a mixture between the Archean style and the younger style that we'll see later on. And the last thing that we'll look about is the Phanerozoic. It tends to be long-lived, greater than 300 billion years in the history, and we have multiple overlapping metallogenic cycles. And I like to summarize that, is that metallogenic histories lengthen with geological time, and you can just see that by comparing the boxes and the length of the boxes. In the Mesio to Neoarchean, you have a single CMMC histories dominate. In the Phanerozoic, you have longer, multiple um, CMMC histories. And then the Paleo Paleoproterozoic is transitional. So there's some systematic patterns that we think relate to tectonic evolution associated with mineralization. And I'm going to look at this in detail in Eastern Australia. So we're going to go look at detail in the uh, Tasman elements. And these are the distribution in time of uh, these deposit types, VHMS deposits, calcalkaline porphyry copper deposits, orogenic gold deposits, alkaline porphyry copper deposits, pegmatite, and granite-related rare metals. And we'll actually just explore as we move in time and in space what's happening here. Okay. And these are well, well dated deposits. There's very little question about the ages of these deposits. They're very, very well uh, thing. And we've actually selected these because that's because of that. So if we start the early part, so we're going to look in the Delamarian, which is shown in through here in the greens, and the deposits are either sort of hosted or associated with the Delamarian. And we can see that you have a VHMS deposit to start with, shown here. And then you have a cal alkalic porphyry copper deposit through here. And then you go to pegmite deposits with, with the orogenic gold deposit somewhere kind of in between. So it suggests that there's one CMMC associated with the Delamarian or, or origin. Okay. One thing that we haven't included is Western Tasmania because we think that Western Tasmania is actually probably exotic, or we're going to consider it exotic relative to, to the west of uh, southeast. Southeastern Australia. So we have one CMMC. It's not that well defined, but it suggests that there's one, one there. Now, if we go to the next um, set of deposits, we're going to actually look at um, these deposits here. So you have VHMS deposit about 480. You have some in, uh, in New, northern New South Wales and in northern Queensland. Then you go to your Cap Alkaline porphyry copper deposits, they're associated with the Macquarie Arc. They're the early porphyry copper deposits associated with, with, with the Macquarie Arc. 
Then you have orogenic gold deposits, and they're located mostly in Victoria, with one example up in the Warada Inlier on the southern margin of the Thompson origin. If we go to the, Cal the alkalic porphyry copper deposits, they're the younger deposits in the Macquarie Arc. Then we look at the pegmatites. You can see there's a few um, in southern New South Wales uh, and into, in, into Victoria. And then finally, we have the granite-related rare metal deposits. And you can see they're actually quite well extended, extensive throughout uh, southeastern Australia. And there's one up in, in northern Queensland. So what can, what can we say? Well, we can say that that's quite a well-defined CMMC. Okay, so, and we're going to call it the Benambran um, CMMC. Uh, it occurs mostly in southeast Australia, but it extends into North Queensland, and it's not known in Tasmania. Nowhere in Tasmania is it known. Might be there, but we don't know that it's there. And we're going to, I'm going to suggest that it might relate to the formation of the Lachlan Orcline, as Peter Cayley, um, Ross Cayley, um, has been talking about uh, in the last few years. And so we'll actually look at that in terms of the melogenic evolution of the um, the uh, Lachlan Oracline. So what we have is at about 480, which is shown um, in that diagram there, you have subduction, it's it's uh, dipping inboard, um, and you have the formation of the uh, calc alcalic porphyry copper deposits at, porphyry, uh, at Copper Hill and VHMS deposits at Triton. And you have a, an exotic train called Vandyland, and this is, this is Ross Cayley's term. Uh, other people call it something different. And it actually accretes during the Benambran orogeny at about 445 million years, okay? At the same time as you have this deformation of that, you have the formation of, of the of orogenic gold deposits. So we're starting to see that CMMMC um, changes. And then as we go into the post-orogenic extension, you start to form your, uh, your alkalic porphyry copper deposits. Um, right in there is Cadia in North Parks. Um, and then finally, you move, in, you, you move back into normal subduction. You go, you go back to stability, and then you start to form another set of VHMS deposits, and you also form some granite-related uh, uh, deposits. So that's what we see in the Lachlan uh, origin, and that's what controls most mineralization in Lachlan origin. And we can actually understand it in terms of this sort of, of concept. So we'll move on through the rest of them. This will take a lot, a lot less time. So we actually look at the, the next one, and that's what we call the Tabarabra. And you can see that's dominate, dominated mostly in Southeast Australia, but there's a few deposits up in North Queensland. Okay. And then we'll move to the younger systems. This one is the Mossman, and this is actually restricted to northern Queensland, possibly the uh, Mount Morgan deposit in, in Queensland, in central Queensland. It might be associated with that. It's not as well defined. We have uh, VHMS deposits followed by orogenic gold deposits, followed by granite-related rare metal deposits, but it's not as well defined. And then finally, we have the Hunter Bowen system. Okay, and that's so that's mainly in New England. Um, it includes the VHMS deposits, uh, orogenic gold deposits, and the granite-related uh, rare metal deposits. An important thing that comes out of this is that the effects can be very strongly inboard. So um, that deposit there is actually the same age. You can't, uh, you can't see it. Anyway, there's a deposit in North Central New South Wales um, that has the same age as the deposits in, in the New England origin. So it suggests that you can have the effects quite strongly inland. Okay, as I say, it's mostly restricted new, to the New England origin. So in summary, we think we have five discrete virgin margin metallogenic cycles present in the Tasman element. We think that three are spatially restricted, the Mossman, um, the Hunter Bowen, and the Delamarian but two seem to be more widespread. And so that's probably telling you something about the environment in which these things are forming, okay? The other thing I think is important is that the pattern might be useful in, to predict undercover potential. So one thing, if you look at the Thompson origin, it's actually largely covered, 
but it appears that you have deposits to the south and deposits to the north. And so it suggests to me you can actually use that information to predict what might occur in between in the undercover regions. And this also applies to the northern Lachlan. So there's some ways that we can actually um, use this information uh, in terms of assessing mineral potential. Okay, so now we're going to actually look at this thing in the in, in the big picture. So we're going to step step back and, and look at the whole world. And so this diagram here just shows you uh, this uh, a diagram showing the relationship between the length of metallogenesis, how long metallogeny occurred, versus the timing of the initiation of metallogenesis. And I say we have 19 separate metallogenic provinces that we, we plotted on this. And you can see there's some patterns there. Okay, first of all, in the mid uh, paleo to mes mid Mesoarchean, we have long lived metallogenesis. We have post metallogenic events, what we saw in the Pilbara, and we don't have any cycles. Okay, you see the same thing in the Cap Vol Craton in, in, in southern Africa. If we go to the mid Mesoarchean, in, uh, into the Neo-Archean, we see the first appearance of single cycle metallogenic cycles that resemble the evolution of modern convergent margins. If we go to the Paleoproterozoic, then we see it's, it's largely similar to the uh, Meso to Neo-Archean systems. We tend to have single cycles, but these single cycles tend to get longer. And after about two billion years, you start to see the first multi-cycle systems appear. So it's telling you something's changing in terms of whatever's controlling these, the metallogeny. And then finally, if we go to the um, Phanerozoic, we actually find long-lived multiple multi-cycle histories, and we have no longer any single cycles. So again, something has changed. And we can actually understand this by looking at it in relationship to mantle cooling. Okay, the two lines that we see on that are different model, models of, of, of mantle, thermal evolutions of the mantle. And the idea is that you have a maximum at between 3.5 and about 3 billion years. And that's in both sort of models. Okay, one model is slightly younger and one model is it's, it's slightly older. But the important thing is prior to about 3.5, five or, or three, you have the mantle is increasing in temperature. Then you have a thermal maximum, and then the mantle starts to cool. Okay, and if you look at that diagram, that change in the thermal characteristics of the mantle actually corresponds quite nicely to the change between the older systems like Capvol and, and, and Pilbara, and the younger systems uh, like the superior uh, basin gold fields, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to suggest that perhaps that is one of the main causes of the changes. Okay, so the other thing is that people have come up with some ideas about the tectonic evolution. So early on, people talk about something called a stagnant wind, and I'll show you a diagram illustrating that later on. Um, but in terms of metallog metallogeny, you see no evidence for convergent margin metallog metallogenesis. We don't see the CM CMMCs. And it's thought to be pre-subduction and associated with stagnant lake tectonics. From the mid Mesoarchean to perhaps the uh, Paleoproterozoic, we see the first complete convergent mar margin metallogenic cycles. And we think that's consistent with some sort of subduction. And we're going to talk about shallow break-off subduction in that case. So shallow break-off is where the subducting plate actually breaks off and just falls down into the mantle. And so you actually have a change in, in the driving um, mechanism of, of, of the system. In the Paleoproterozoic, the cycles become longer lived and the margins become more stable and start to record multiple events, multiple cycles. And finally, we go to the Phanerozoic where we have long-lived metallogenic histories, long-lived convergent margins. We no longer have single cycles. 
And we're going to suggest that that's related to the development of deep break-off subduction. That is when the uh, subducting slab breaks off deeper into the mantle. And just to illustrate these sorts of concepts, um, we look at the, the stagnant lid, no subduction model, and this is for the Pilbara and the Cat Fall, and this is based on the Pilbara. And what we have is, is an oceanic plateau, and we have different styles of deposits forming within that oceanic plateau, uh, including orogenic bowl deposits, VHMS deposits. It suggests that the individual deposits are not necessarily diagnostic of a tectonic setting, but when you assemble them together, it can tell you something. And there are a number of different mechanisms that people think about in terms of the way they form, but there are some differences, okay? In detail, you find that the orogenic gold deposits in the Pilbara in particular, and also the Cap Vol, um, are associated with ring dikes around granites, okay? That's quite different from what you see in the Yilgarn, where they're associated with very long, uh, laterally extensive structures, and they're not associated with the, the, the ring faults around, around the um, granites. So that suggests some differences in terms of, of, of the way these things form. Now, if we actually move to the younger periods of time, if we go from 3,100 to 800 million years ago, we have what we think shallow uh, subduction break off. Okay. And this just is a model where you actually break off the subducting uh, plate, which is shown in the, in the yellow. Um, and it just falls down and it causes unstable convergence because you don't have the driver. If, if, the, if the driving force falls off, then you no longer have that convergent margin and it's just going to stop and it's going to freeze. Okay. And so that is why we think we have single CMMCs. However, if we go at about 800 million years, when we think steep break off uh, subduction started to occur, you can see that in this model here, and this is a, a thermal model, uh, it suggests that the uh, subducting slab remains consolidated until it actually meets, goes well down into the uh, mantle. And so you have that motive force, you have that driving force of the density of that subducting um, plate, which is actually driving your convergent margins. And because it's a stable thing, if you get stability of stable convergent margins, and if something perturbs them, it's gonna be very hard to stop the, the, the convergence. And so you're going to actually get long-lived millogenic cycles, which are punctuated by events such as the accretion of an exotic terrain or the flattening of subductions and things like that. The only time you're going to stop these things is when you have two major plates smashing together. Okay, so in terms of the diagram that we saw before, we'd actually like to add a few things. Okay, and this is in terms of metallogenesis. Okay, so in terms of what we've I've tried to show in this talk is uh, early in the Archean, you have no convergent margin metallogenic cycles. You have long punctuated metallogenic histories. And then you, you go from the uh, middle Archean um, into the uh, Neoproterozoic, you have single CMMCs and short metallogenic histories, which grade into few CMMCs with a longer metallogenic history. And then finally, during modern uh, in, in, in modern, after about 800 million years ago, we have many CMCs, you have long quasi-continuous metallogenic histories. So we think that we can use the metallogenic history to add to the characteristics we see um, in, in this diagram. So in summary, we think that metallogenic cycles allow to fingerprint the evolution of convergent margins in, in stages. The metallogenic history shows systematic variations through time, and we think are a new tool that can be used to constrain the secular evolution of the Earth. They indicate an early pre-subduction sta uh, stage, followed by the onset of unstable subduction from the mid Archean. The changes in the history indicate a trend towards long-lived stable convergent margins through time, and these changes are consistent with secular cooling of the mantle through time. And with that, I'll just answer any questions. Thanks, Dave.
David. I'll take a question from the floor. Anthony. Thanks, Anna. Really interesting. Just curious to know this shift in style then. Does that also does that change the style of the individual deposits that you get? Is it lots of smaller deposits? We, we haven't looked into that. I mean, it's a different possibility that we're investigating. Um, and we probably have the data sets to be able to make that inquiry. Um, and, oh, sorry. And, um, yeah, we might have the data sets to make that inquiry. And if so, it might have implications in terms of metallogeny and, and mineral prospectivity of different belts. So it's, it's definitely worthwhile doing, and, and we thought about doing similar sorts of things. Thanks. I'll just repeat the questions from now on. Um, there's a question online from Patrice. How does the how does this spatiotemporal cyclicity impact prospectivity of the covered Thompson origin? Can one predict what to look for? Okay. It seems that um, we have evidence of the existence of the um, Benambran CMMC in the Lachlan Fold Belt, but also in the northern part of the Thompson Fold Belt. So I would think that there's potential for all of those deposit types within the covered part of the, of, of, of the Thompson origin. Um, and I think it can be used in, in that way. It's going to be a very coarse sort of thing, and, and you'll be able to just determine belts where you think you might have VHMS deposits or porphyry copper deposits, and you can use that as a guideline and look for other characteristics. Um, so it's something that I think we can we can start to use um, in in understanding the under uh, the potential. Is there another question from the floor? So I'll just repeat that there appears to be a lack of deposits in the neo Archean. Um, how does that relate, David? Or is that is that a correct assumption? Um, well, the problem is that the porphyry copper deposit is dominated by the young young examples. And so whenever you see a uh, a diagram, and I've plotted those uh, those diagrams up, and other people have plotted those diagrams, you see this huge spike, and then you see the grass, and the and the neo Archean and all of that is in the grass. Um, and so you have to make up the, the grass and you have to expand the grass. And there are some patterns there. Um, there are some Neo-Archean porphyry copper light deposits. Um, it's um, some in Canada. Um, and I think there's one or two even in the in the in the yield garden, but we don't have enough data and we don't have enough age data on that. But the other thing you have to think about is that these things are not likely to be preserved because they're forming up in the upper parts of, of arcs. And so it's less likely for those to be preserved. So I consider the absence of porphyry copper deposits through time is part, part, partly a um, just an erosional um, result. So we we need more data basically to really answer your question, but there's some ideas that, that might explain it. A question from online from Evgeny. How do IOCGs fit into this picture, Dave? Um, Evgeny, you, you, you make a, a difficult question here. Um, and we've had arguments about, well, we've had discussions about this. Um, I think certain parts of certain types of IOCG deposits probably fit in, like the ones in Chile. Um, they probably fit in into the system, um, but I'm not sure that all IOCG deposits are created equal. Um, and there's some which probably form in divergent systems or uh, deformed divergent systems, um, and so they're actually not really part of the. I wouldn't consider them part of the convergent margin. Um, system and and I think the next thing that I would like to see someone or a group of people do is look at the at those other 
systems in, in the same sort of um, way that we're looking at the convergent margin systems. Because uh, there are some patterns that you can see. Uh, if you go to North Queensland, you start with Broken Hill type deposits, it's Cannington. Then you go to Mount Isa type deposits. Then you go, the, for some strange reason, you go to the IOCG deposits. Um, and there seems to be a, a pattern there. And you can see that uh, in a few other places, like in um, Georgetown, you can see the same sort of thing where you start out with um, a Broken Hill type deposit at Chloe. Then you go to Kaiser Bill, which is uh, a iron oxide copper gold deposit, but you're missing the Mount Isa type deposits. So there's some patterns that you can see, uh, but I think they're part of a different tectonic system. All right, we've got quite a few questions online. Um, Dave, how can we relate the model of subduction phases and metallogenesis to episodes of subduction advance and retreat? That's actually a great question. It's, 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 it's something that um, we've been thinking a lot about. Um, and so if we look at the difference between the Andean margin, which is um, where the subduction is moving forward and, and um, advancing, and you compare that to the uh, West, West Pacific margin, i.e. what you see in, in uh, off Indonesia and, and Tonga, et cetera, there actually are differences in terms of the metallogeny. So if you look at the Andean system, all you see is porphyry copper deposits, okay? And so I think, and, you, and the important thing is that you don't get back arc basins uh, in the Andean system. So, that, so if you have the uh, advancing accretion area or, or, or orogenous, then you're not going to get those back arc basins. So you're not going to form the VHMS deposits, but you are going to form the porphyry copper deposits. Okay. And one of the discussions that we've had in terms of rudinia, which we didn't talk about, but it's, it's a dog basically for um, metallogeny, um, the rudinia assembly, so that's the Grenvillian. And one of the ideas that we've had is that maybe the Grenvillian was dominated by advancing accretionary or, or, or a genesis. And so you formed a lot of porphyry copper deposits, but not much in the way of, of VHMS deposits. Um, and the porphyry copper deposits were eroded. And I had a question uh, a couple of, a week ago about that. And there has been some suggestion that maybe the reason you got such large neoproterozoic um, sediment hosted copper gold deposit because you had a big source of copper eroding into the basins at that time. So it's kind of elegant, but it's really difficult to, to, to test. So I think there's something to that. Um, and yeah, it, it's a lot of stuff that we can look at. Is there another question in the room? Yes, Karen. Yes, uh, great talk, David. Uh, I'm just curious. If you take the Tasman's example, the deep slab break-off, do we really expect the slab to be continuous through that period? If that all those accretions have been expected to have a series of slabs depending on exactly what's being created. Yeah, well, in a, in a Tasman origin, a, a Tasman um, element, um, the idea is that you had a basically a, an east or a west dipping subduction zone probably continues through most most of, of, of that time and so what happens is you accrete tasmania okay that causes a, a perturbation but that subduction still has to continue because you can't you can't stop it because of, of, of the weight pulling it down and so what happens is is you get your orogenic event and then the the, the subduction either uh, back steps and moves outward uh, or it changes its 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 um, um, its dip, and so it starts again. And so you never really stop it; you just perturb it, I guess. And so you get this continuous sort of subduction with perturbations, which which cause a lot of the mineralization. Yeah. So I guess I would, I would agree with that, but this, to expect the slab to be continuous. So I just repeat the question: Do you expect the slab to be continuous? Yeah, I, I would. I would expect it. I, un, unless you have a good reason for it to break off, I would expect it to be continuous. It would just move outboard or restart, or or I don't think. I guess it's possible that you could break it off, but I would think that it would still. You, you'd still have that that density driver. 
Um, it's something I haven't really thought about, so I'll have to think about it more. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty scrolling down to see all the questions. Um, is there another question from the room while I try to restore this? Yeah, Anthony. So um, you mentioned this change in um, metamorphic uh, ET grading between modern times post A15 and pre A15. But it was some, some people have said that was a step change, and some people have said it was kind of a gradual drift, and they kind of deconvolved that into two peaks that were overlapping and kind of separated over time. I'm just wondering kind of which one you favor in terms of step change or gradual change in subduction. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, so to paraphrase, um, so there's a question that is it a sorry, so step change, or step change or gradual change between eight ten and, and oh yeah, so there's the pre eight fifty and from the pre and post eight fifty. Um, in terms of my thoughts, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you know, if you go from shallow break off to deep break off it could be a step change um but i i have no real strong preference in in that regard i don't know if if michael wants to say anything there's a thread of a Because there is an addition of a sharp, a sharp of step once you that's just not as coherent around you to work. That continues the deep subduction, that's hard to show because we don't have really good data sets in the time in the near border so it's not a part of the border so. Um, so I see this combination of those and that's the thread wheel is modified by steps. So combination of both there. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'll take that as the last question. Thank you, David. Um, okay. Unless there's one final quick one from the floor. Okay. Please thank David for his talk today.